Hello, and before we start today's video, a quick disclaimer straight off the bat. This video is going to be about whether you should go for bigger drives or you should go for more drives. Should you go for 20 TBs or get yourself some 4s and 6s and get a big old raid on the go there? But before we start, it's worth highlighting the whole of today's video is going to be me on screen working on screen recording. It's just going to be a lot easier to show you all the information to do with drive pricing and drive capacity and rates and stuff if I do it on screen. So I just didn't want you guys to think it was a cop-out, so I just sat there on my bed at home doing this video. I'm definitely doing it here in the studio, and in today's video, I'm going to give you five good reasons why you should go for bigger drives, and five good reasons why you should be going for lots of smaller drives there. Let's start that intro and get ourselves on that screen. Okay, so in order to go through all of the points of comparing big, high-capacity drives versus lots of smaller drives, it's worth bearing a few things in mind for today's video. First and foremost, we are going to be using Synology's own RAID calculator several times in this video. I'll try and link to it in the description, but it should hopefully give you some idea about some of the mathematics that are involved in a lot of the RAID configurations. The next thing is on the right-hand side of the screen there, I've got the prices for Seagate Ironwolf Standard Class, so not Pro drives here on the right hand side from 1 TB to 18 TB and I've gone WD Red Pro from 4 TB to 22 TB. Why I've gone for normal um, Iron Wolf and Pro Series WD Red will make sense later on in the video but we're going to need these calculations here on the right hand side a lot of times throughout this video to help you understand a lot of the points to a more finer degree and all of these are prices right now at uh, the time of recording here on the 5th of January 2022 on Amazon there for all of that pricing structure so obviously if you're watching this in the future Future, those prices might be all over the shop and finally while we're going through this it's worth highlighting I spent a lot of time figuring out where in this screen I was going to be because I'm recording this on OBS and I decided at the top left because I'm going to be using the full screen throughout this video so I apologize if occasionally my big old face here at the top on the screen is covering something there on uh, that I'm trying to show you there so I apologize in advance so the first big point, something I've talked about in other videos before, that I think gets hugely overlooked, is actually the savings in price that can be made when you go for more drives versus singular larger drives. Now, to put that into perspective, let's say, first and foremost, and I'm going to have to glance at my notes from time to time, that you want to have 12 terabytes of storage let's say in your nas it doesn't have to be an 8 bay but say you want 12 tb of storage you got your 12 tb there but bear in mind of course you've got to factor in your raid as well so if we go for a couple of 12s and we will talk a little bit more about that later on if you want to make sure that you've got both capacity and redundancy and you go for big drives, you can see there that a couple of 12 TB drives in there, factoring in an SHR or a RAID 1, for example, will result in 12 TB of storage if you had to buy two 12 TB drives there. So 12 TB, if you go for the Seagate iWolf, is $258. So two drives there, that's $516 there. <clears throat> but another way that you can achieve 12 TB, if we get rid of these drives, is to go for three 6 TB drives. So if you go for three 6 TB drives, you still get your 12 TB, this time in a RAID 5 configuration, and the 6 TB is $158 there. So that would result in around about $474, um, um, uh, maybe my math is off there by about $10. But ultimately, you are spending less money per terabyte by going for more drives. Now, you might think that's a fluke, but in a lot of cases, not all, I'd say 60 or 70 percent of cases, this logic runs true. Another example would be to go for, say, 18 TB drives. So if you go for the 18 TB drives there, and again, they are $386 currently on Seagate, a couple of those to make sure you've got your rage of safety net there, you've got 18 TB there, and you've spent, you know, getting close to $650-$700 there or thereabouts. Bear in mind again that these do not include shipping and do not include tax, this pricing. So again, prices will be different around the world and also your local tax and shipping will apply. So again, that is to achieve 18 TB there. But another way you can achieve 18 terabytes of storage is if you want to, again, use 6 TB. So if you go for four 6 TB drives, 
you've got your 18 TB there. And 6 TB, again, was 158. So again, you are spending a little over, I think it's 632, I believe, um, dollars there. So again, it's not a tremendous saving, but you are saving money when you go for more drives over uh, fewer larger hard drives there and again you can test that out and it's not always true but generally whenever you find using four or six db multipliers you find that the more smaller drives end up costing you less overall Now, it's all fair and well us talking about the money you'll save when you go for those individual drives, but we have we can't ignore the fact that if you're going to be using more hard drives, you're going to need a, a NAS with more bays to put it in. And NASs with more bays cost more money. During this calculator, we're looking at an, um, you know this thing here, which I just realized has an unusual number of bays. There is no Synology I know of that's got that many bays in desktop in that shape. But... If you go for larger capacity drives, so choosing a 20 TB drive rather than a 10 TB drive, you can get a smaller NAS rather than going for a NAS with lots of bays. To put that into perspective, uh, this is the QNAP TS-264, the two bay of the QNAP 64 series NAS. So you could put a couple of drives inside there and if you went for the two 20 or 10 TB drives there, yes, you're gonna spend more money on the drives, but as you can see here, this NAS is $439. If you go for the four bay version, it's $573. So going for the four bay NAS is going to cost you more money. It's also worth highlighting as well that the smaller NASs, you tend to find that they arrive with more memory these days by default. And this is to do with memory shortages. It's nothing to do with traditional uh, values, uh, hard drive specification man, uh, values and NASs, just because of memory shortages and chip shortages at the moment. We're seeing a lot of two-bay NASs that would have originally had two or four gig of memory being sold by default with eight gig modules there because of the shortages. And the result is they can't force people to spend more money. So you're seeing a lot of two-bays that normally should have two or four gig arriving with eight gig or sometimes even 16 gig for noticeably less than if you'd bought the upgrade on its own. The result is that yes, you're gonna spend more if you buy two bigger drives rather than four or more smaller drives, but you're saving money on the NAS. So it actually can balance out. And in some cases, you actually save more money and get better value on a smaller NAS at the time of recording at least than it would be going for a bigger NAS there like this one, which has got four gig of memory and costs more money. So again, where you're saving your money, it's not cut and dry between the big and the small drives when you factor in the rest of the hardware architecture. Yes, this is an obvious one, but it is often said the problem with larger drives is all those eggs in one basket. Let's go back to our uh, um, uh, calculator here. Let's say, again, let's go back to that original um, one earlier on where we went for two 12TB drives inside there. We've got a couple of 12TBs, we've got our 12TB of storage, and we've got our one disk of redundancy. But we're putting a lot of eggs in one basket there. So even if we go for a single drive, the problem is still going to be that if we go for a bigger drive, let's say we cancel that out, get rid of those, and this time go for the 18, or even if you went towards 20 and 22 TB drives currently, because you're putting all your eggs in one basket, you're kind of forced to buy two drives. Because if you are buying a big drive because you plan on having a lot of storage capacity, then that data must be quite important if you're gonna be spending a lot of money. So one big drive almost immediately necessitates a second one there. And having all your eggs in one basket is forcing you to either have to double bubble your spending or you're now in a position where you're putting too much of your important data in one single drive there. So do bear that in mind. I know it's trite and I know it's repeated often, but there's no avoiding that the whole too many eggs in one basket philosophy is a very painful hurdle of larger hard drives.
Yes, continuing down that road, it's not all cut and dry when it comes down to that point of failure because when the more hard drives you use, you're actually expanding your point of failure. And even though putting all your eggs in one basket with a big drive didn't sound great, the more hard drives you have, the more potential points of failure you have. And if you have more than, if you have significantly more drives, then you have to start moving towards RAID 6 and other RAID configurations, even triple parity RAIDs, where you need to have redundancy levels that can keep up with multiple drives. Now, what I mean by that is, let's go for an example. If we go, for, if we went for two 10 TB drives, okay? So we've got two 10 TB drives now inside. We've got our 10 TB of storage and 10 TB of redundancy. Now let's see if we went low, low, low and we decided to try to hit that number with two TB drives that were on the market because you do see tremendous savings around. You would have to get six two TB drives in order to have that one drive of redundancy and still have that 10 TB. But now you have spread out the point of failure. And when you do buy bulk hard drives from any vendor, from an e-shop, directly from the brand, they don't go up to a shelf and pick all of these drives from different boxes. They pick them all from the same case of 20 or 24 or 30 TB cases. Now, if there is a fault in a hard drive due to a manufacturing error, if there's a fault due to materials or poor um, mechanical workmanship during the mass production process, there's every possibility that it isn't just affecting that one drive. It could have affected the batch, hence the term thrown around a bad batch of drives. If you go to the back blaze stats, you do hear that. So the result is that if you do have multiple drives, you will open the door to multiple points of failure. And that's why you're then forced to have to consider maybe a RAID 6. So with a RAID 6 now, we're going to have to increase our drives and add another 2TB drive to maintain that within that RAID 6 environment. So having multiple drives, although you're not putting all your eggs in one basket, you are then opening the door to multiple points of failure. This point is a little bit more nebulous, but smaller hard drives, because they've been around in the market a lot longer, you tend to find a lot more special offers on them. Bigger hard drives being a lot newer, there are fewer in the market because they've just been produced. The result is that larger hard drives very rarely get the same level of offers and savings that you see on smaller hard drives there. So whether you're going on websites like Newegg that are more aggregate in their offers, or you go to things like Amazon where you can look at a drive and then decide by looking on the right hand side of the screen that you want to view the offers that are available the result is let's go for say a 4tb drive there that you can find out different offers that are in the market for smaller hard drives you generally find deals during black friday prime day a lot more uh, common on the smaller capacities out there than you do find on the bigger ones which means if you are going to go the multi-drive route that opens the door to even more savings being possible when compared with going to fewer but larger hard drives overall Again, it's another slightly nebulous point, but one that I think is starting to become a little bit more, um, you know, public aware is energy consumption. Now, hard drives are not the greediest in terms of power consumption, but it's worth highlighting that the bigger NAS you go for, because you've got more drives, the more energy it's going to consume and therefore how much more it's going to cost you in power. Normally you find the bigger the NAS, the bigger the PSU that's inside, obviously that is uh, a, like, it's like a bandwidth thing, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to use that maximum amount of power, but you find more aggressive CPUs, more aggressive cooling systems, and therefore larger NASs to accommodate more drives use more power. But it also extends to the drives themselves. If we go into uh, WD Red uh, spreadsheet, let's find it somewhere on here, we can see that whether you're looking at 22 TB drives or scaling down to the lower capacities, power usage 1.7, 1.8, 1.85, if we make our way down to the lower capacities, the power is still 1.7, 1.8. And the result is that if you go for fewer larger hard drives, you're actually using less power up. Yes, it's very small because we're talking about smaller drives, but that combined with the impact of a larger RAID array to utilize more drives results in 
uh, are using lots more smaller hard drives, consuming a little bit more power, which you know can add up. So whether it's for money reasons or energy conscious reasons, reasons it's worth highlighting that more drives equals more power use. Another thing that often gets overlooked is about performance, both internally and externally. And if you use more drives, it actually increases your performance quite substantially. Again, let me explain. We're not going to worry too much about capacity in this example, but let's go for 4TB drives. Now, if we had a couple of 4TB drives in here, we're going to ignore capacity for a bit. We're going to focus just on those. When you are reading and writing to the drives, in the right RAID configuration, such as a RAID 0, you can have it so that when you're reading and writing, you are writing and reading from two disks simultaneously, depending on the RAID configuration. Again, RAID 1 with mirrored disks and uh, RAID 0 with combining them together. So again, there's benefits either side of the seesaw. But... If you've only got two drives there, you are accessing two drives at once with all of them speeding, uh, spinning together. Now, if you go for a larger configuration, a larger RAID, such as a RAID 5 or a RAID 6, yes, the system does need to calculate um, the parity data there in the background in order to maintain redundancy, but modern generation NASs have really improved upon those calculations and the impact on the CPU and resources, resulting in much lower resource hit when calculating the RAID. The result is that the more drives you have, the faster the performance. And those of you that have got modest 4-bay devices, like the DS923+, Plus or the TS464, which have PCIe upgrades to allow you to add a 10GBE uh, connection there on the rear. I don't know how well that's appearing there on screen for you. Um, the result is that having those extra drives means that you can fully saturate 10GBE, whereas if you only had two drives inside with only two drives being read and written to so if you went for the same series nas which again has that pcie upgrade slot as well the result is going to be that you won't be able to hit the same height so again a much overlooked feature of multiple drives is just higher read and write performance as more drives are being accessed at any given time Let's talk about noise. That is right, because there's actually kind of a quibble and a dig to be made against both big drives and multiple drives when it comes to the old eardrums. Now, let's start off with whether you've got multiple drives. If you are going to have multiple drives, so if we go ahead and slam in uh, some 8TB drives here, if we slammed in five 8TB drives in a 5-bay like the DX, uh, DS1522+, Plus, I can tell you right now that the more drives you use, the more ambient noise is going to be generated. As multiple drives with, let's go for the disc there, as they've all got platters that are spinning there in the background, they've all got the little R on the actuator dancing between each of the platters there. The result is that those larger conglomeration of drives is going to make more noise. Indeed, the larger the NAS you have to occupy the more drives, the more fans that are on there, the more active cooling as to work in conjunction with the passive cooling. And just generally, the minute you go bigger than about four or five bays, they all are metal, these NASs. So they all start to make a little bit more ambient noise as they work with it, the hum, the whir, and the clicks of the drives and the general vibration there. So more drives can equal more noise. How Ever. At the same time, if we remove all of our 8TB drives, it's also worth highlighting that if you went ahead and installed a couple of 18TB drives inside, larger enterprise grade drives actually make more noise. Now, I've talked about this on the channel more and more, and I feel it's a fact that is still not really known as much as it should be. I hate seagulls. Um, it is that larger capacity drives in enterprise or pro series states they've got larger cache they've got more platters they've started using helium so therefore they can make the platters thinner and get more inside the spin up slow down the movement of the actuator and the arms even enterprise grade drives that start to arrive with dual actuators or triple stage action where the um, actual mechanics of the arm are actually moved up and down as it has to move around the disc a lot more efficiently the result is that these drives make more noise in operation yes you'll have fewer drives and therefore the combined multiplying factor of noise will be reduced but it, that 
hum whir vibration noise is going to be replaced with a different kind of noise with fewer larger drives if you definitely if you exceed 8 or 10 tb the result is these drives make a lot more clicks they make a lot more spin noise so what you get instead of vibration and something that's being amplified through the nasa chassis itself you get drives that sound like they're broken they're not but they sound by traditional senses like they are do look at my videos on nas drive noise look at any drive above 10 tb or any pro or enterprise grade tier that's your exos that's your ultra star even synology's own hard drives which are built on enterprise grade hard drives they are enterprise grade and sound like it so again it all they're both going to be noisy sets if you have lots of drives or you have two big drives and the ultimate answer is to go for fewer smaller drives but that's not really helping anyone how is it Now this again is slightly nebulous but one that is becoming truer and truer with every passing year. Um, we're finding more and more because of the construction of enterprise grade hard drives and the work that goes into them and the fact that it's very hard to make uh, a non-enterprise drive um, you know in the way it's constructed um, without you know going higher capacity and enterprise construction the result is that more and more brands are only releasing larger capacities in pro that's why on the right hand side of the screen i was sure to include standard seagate and wd red pro the reason being that with wd red if you want to go a standard class drive you can only go up to 14 tb if you want to exceed 14 tb you have to go pro so when you go pro it you are then accessing the larger capacities but unfortunately pro series drives are noisier they're more power consuming and not by a huge degree but they are noticeable and more expensive overall now there are deals out there with non-pro drives but there's still no avoiding that pro series drives if you want to go for a bigger capacity you're kind of having your arms tied behind your back in some cases that you've got to go pro now this is not a universal rule if you head over to seagate for example seagate still to this day are still producing non-pro large-scale drives so if we make our way into the seagate listings there for non-pro so let's go for a standard class there and we can look on amazon for example and go right the way down to if we click along we can actually i believe get to 14 16 there may even be bigger drives now in the non-pro series this is not being very responsive at all um but right now, you can go ahead and find non-pro Seagate drives for a larger capacity. So, for example, in the non-pro stakes, you can even get up to 18 TB non-pro. This is something they've been slowly whittling down, and there are fewer non-pro larger capacity drives. But if you look at Toshiba, you look at WD, and Seagate's other ranges and you look at things like Barracuda, you do find that more and more we're seeing that larger capacity drives are being locked to Enterprise and Pro tiers because of their construction simply being not possible to make them non-pro. So do bear that in mind if you're looking at bigger drives to factor in that cost of electricity and the noise that we've already discussed. Finally, this, much like our point earlier on about noise, is going to kind of impact on you and how you see buying modern technology. Because it should also be said that if you go for smaller capacity drives, you're kind of missing out on some of the newer um, technology and newer innovations that are going into storage that are improving performance, stability, and just overall capacity. If you go for larger drives, and we are talking 18 TB and above, uh, at least predominantly now and certainly in the next year or two when we go towards 26 tb and even 30 tb uh, newer generation drives are arriving with technology such as optinand on the wd platform optinand for those that aren't aware is on their discs they have a small area of flash storage i believe 64 gig and that area of storage is then used to house data for the drive itself metadata index data and more 
that is then taken away from the other platters and allows the platters to be fuller by that extra degree. And on those 10 platters, 2.2 TB each, larger capacity. That's something that's just not available under 18 or 20 TB. Same goes for some of the recording technologies that are coming out, such as HAMR, Heat Assisted Magnetic Recording, and EAMR, Energy Assisted Magnetic Recording, being utilized on drives. And when we go towards Seagate again, we look at Mac 2, giving us larger capacities and double performance. In the majority of cases, all of these innovations are not available on the smaller drives there. It is one of the reasons why the newer drives are a bit pricier, because they've got to get an ROI on that RMD, but still nonetheless, you're going to be missing out on those innovations if you go for the smaller drives. However, before you write it in the comments, Graham, Malcolm, or whatever your name is, you're right. There is a school of thought that the last thing you want to do is jump on new technology until it's had a decent amount of field testing. Let the other mugs, let, their, let them lose their data before you jump on board. That's right. There is a seesaw here where there is the idea that you might be missing out on this tech, but there's also the counter argument that you didn't want to be there at the front line anyway. You wanted the technology to have a few years in the spinner to see and irk itself out, work out the bugs before you put you and your precious data on there. There is an argument either side there, but ultimately that is it. This has been, is it better to buy bigger drives or more drives? Is there a point I've missed? Is there something you disagree with? Is there enough points that I've missed to make a follow-up to this video? I've really enjoyed making this video, and this is one that I've wanted to make for about a year or so. Thank you so much for watching. If you did enjoy this video, hopefully there will be a link to the written guide below, which I will update as more points arrive. Other than that, click like if you've enjoyed the video. It really helps me out. Subscribe if you want to learn more. If you need free advice, Use the free advice section over on NAS Compare link below. It's the big blue button on the right hand side of NAS Compare's website. Use the free community forum at Ask NAS Compares with me, my colleague Eddie, and the rest of the NAS community who will answer your questions. And if you found this video helpful and you are going to buy from Amazon anyway, please go in the description and use the links to Amazon to take you there. It won't cost you anything extra and anything. And I really do mean. Anything that you buy will result in a kickback coming to NAS Compares, where it's just me and Eddie running this, and it will allow us to keep doing what we do. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.